The two most important things that we need to navigate our lives by is to understand who God is and who we are in relationship to God. There is no other chapter in the Bible that speaks into that quite like the very first chapter in the Bible. These two fundamentally important elements, who God is and who you are in relationship to God, is the focus of Genesis chapter 1. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, I talked about this chapter and we marveled together over the literary complexity of this chapter and how intricately this was this is put together just the tr- the true artfulness literary artfulness of this chapter and it is a chapter that uh, expresses how God orders things and and I talked about the relationship of order and rest and throughout the chapter we see God ordering his creation and creating this beautifully fine-tuned world and That's also expressed in the form, the literary form of the chapter we talked about, even how many times various words are used. You know, we said that uh, there were seven words in the first verse, 14 words in the second, multiples of seven are so important, 35 uses of the word God, 35 words in the description uh, of the seven day, and you go on and on and on, and I really only sort of, Uh, skim the surface of what there is to say about this profound chapter of the Bible. And I said that, uh, you know, I would need at least three hours to really cover it, and I didn't quite cover it last week. So what I want to do today is I want to focus on a very important, very climactic moment uh, of this chapter, and that is the chapter that speaks to the creation of humanity, because this morning I want to remind you of who you are and what that means even what that means in the micro moments of life. This is something really important that we need to recapture. How you respond in your circumstances has everything to do with who you think you are. So we're gonna look at this this morning and I'm gonna read to you uh, Genesis chapter one, verses 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. One thing that's evident here, if you follow the patterns, and of course, as I said, patterns are very important uh, in this text and it communicates its message in patterns. I pointed out that there are 10 divine commands and God said 10 times. There are also 10 times it says throughout the chapter, God created everything according to their kinds, talking about the plants and the animals in the world. It says God created everything according to their kind. There's also a significance in where you see a break in the pattern. And when it comes to the creation of human beings, instead of saying that they were created according to their kind, it says that they were created, essentially, it's saying they were created according to the image of God. Now this means that that there's this sense in which human beings are set apart. And the biblical word for that that's repeated throughout the Bible is the word holy. We often, Um, read the word holy as perhaps uh, meaning morally pure. Now, that that can be part of it, but the word holy actually is so much more than that. Ultimately, to be holy is to be set apart. When the Bible talks about God as being holy and with a great declaration of the Bible is God is holy, holy, holy. Triplets are important for expressing uh, superlatives. God is holy, holy, holy. It means that God is, the absol- is absolute, 
absolutely transcendent. God is above everything else. There are acknowledged in the Bible other spiritual beings and so forth, but God is holy means that God is distinct, above, absolutely other. And we are called, we were created to be holy and we are called to be holy. God says, be holy as I am holy. And that means that we are set apart. This is so important, this sense of set apartness, this sense uh, of sacredness. Another way of saying that is that we are sacred. And this is very important for understanding. This is a key undergirding value and principle for understanding the nature of the Christian life. Because we recognise that because we are sacred, if something is sacred, it means that you can't just do anything you want with it something I've repeated. And particularly in our culture, this is really important. If something is sacred, it means you can't just do whatever you want with it. It means that it's set apart for a sacred purpose. For something to be sacred has this sense of belonging in a very special way to God. And that it therefore matters how you live your life. It also says here of human beings that we are, specifically we are created in the likeness, in the image of God. This amongst other things, and this probably means a number of things and there's lots of discussion over exactly what that means, but at a a very basic level, this means that we are God's children. Let me compare this to uh, Genesis chapter five, verses one to three, where it says this, It says, when God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and he named them mankind when they were created. And then in verse three, it says this, Adam had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. So to say that we were created in God's likeness, in God's image, means that we are God's children. Now, this is really important. One of the things that I said about Genesis chapter one is that it is in very deliberate conversation with the various worldviews of its day, with the various religions of its day. There were a number of different creation myths in the ancient world. And in a very brilliant way, this intricately designed theological text is in deliberate conversation. It evokes a number of the sort of ideas that are at work in ancient, Eastern, uh, ancient Near Eastern creation myths, and it's correcting those in some amazing ways. And this is one of the ways in which it does this, is by elevating humankind. In all the other ancient creation myths, and this is true right up into the Greek period, human beings are a kind of an afterthought, that they were created uh, to serve the gods, to feed the gods even, and there's no real special status uh, as such. What's happening here is that human beings are being elevated to a very, very high position. There is no higher view of humanity than there is in the Bible. The Bible holds human dignity in very, 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 uh, in a very high sense. It also, uh, one of the things that is evoked by this idea of being created in God's image. In the ancient world, kings, when they would, um, wherever their territory was, in order to signify that this belonged to them, they would uh, place images of themselves. These kings, they would replace, they would place images of themselves uh, in their various territories. And so there's a sense here in which God, by placing us, his image in his creation, is that we uh, have a role to actually reflect who God is and actually also reflect God's rule. It's interesting too, in, uh, in, in many cases, kings were seen uh, and, and as being uh, sons of God in a sense. The idea of being uh, a son of God was something that was reserved for kings in the ancient Near East. What is really interesting about this text is that it's basically saying, no, it's kind of democratizing this idea. It's saying, no, we are all human beings are truly what the kings claim to be, but even in a higher sense. I'll say it again, there is no higher view of humanity than there is in the Bible. 
But that high view of humanity comes with responsibility. If we are sacred, if we are set apart, belonging to God in a very, very special way as children of God, then that is something that we need to live up to. And this is where we come to God's instruction, our purpose in life. God says to us that we are to subdue, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over. It's interesting, that's actually exactly the same. It's a different way of saying exactly what Jesus says when he says, go, into, um, when he says, go and make disciples of all the nations. To subdue, to rule over and subdue, by the way, is not to exploit. Um, when we, to rule over means that we rule over in God's stead. This is not absolute authority, this is a derived authority. We are commissioned to rule in God's stead, to reflect God's rule and to steward the perfect order of God in creation. We're not to instrumentalize the world for our purposes and that folks is everything that's wrong with the world <laughs> is that we have instrumentalized everything on this planet for our purposes and we have upset the beautiful fine-tuned order in creation, we've upset it, profoundly upset it. And this is what we, in our day particularly, this is what we're facing. And it's caused turmoil in the uh, environment. We were never meant to instrumentalize, never meant to exploit nature. That's not what subduing the earth means. It means cultivate God's order in creation, be the stewards of God's creation, and we're accountable to God for that. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and we are its stewards. This is the high responsibility that we have as children of God. One of the things that I want to say this morning, what the key point that I wanna make is the connection between authority and responsibility. I wanna highlight responsibility. And I wanna do that because there's something within our nature, something built in our nature that causes us to naturally shirk responsibility. We naturally step away from responsibility. We like to criticize other people when they fail to fulfill their responsibility, but we, we ourselves uh, typically are very slow to step in and take responsibility for things. This is essentially what happened in the fall of mankind as it's described, again in a very condensed text, a condensed account in Genesis chapter three. Essentially what that story is conveying is the abdication of responsibility. Now the word abdication we talk about, you know, when, when a king uh, steps down from the throne, I don't wanna be responsible for that anymore, I don't wanna be responsible. And, and we talk about kings abdicating their rule, right? And what we see in Genesis chapter three is an abdication of responsibility. And we see this not only in the fact that human beings decided not to make themselves, not to obey God, but we even see when God called them to account, well actually, interestingly, the first thing that we see when human beings rebelled against God, the first thing they did is hide. <laughs> like, they hid. That's that stepping back. I'm not gonna take responsibility for this. And then when God called them out, where, where are you? Adam, where are you? Adam steps out and God says to Adam, this is kind of paraphrased, but this is, uh, you can read the text for itself. This is what it says. God calls Adam to account. He says, what is this that you have done? And what did Adam say? He says, the woman that you made, she made me do it. And then God confronts, uh, Eve, the woman, and says, what is this that you have done? And she says, the, the serpent that you created, he made me do it. You know, the devil made me do it. That is abdication of responsibility. That's stepping back. It wasn't my fault. I'm not responsible. And by doing that, they disempowered. Every time you abdicate responsibility, every time you give up responsibility, you give up authority we profoundly disempower ourselves when we step away from responsibility. 
See, we think we're freeing ourselves uh, of something. And of course, you know, when we take on, the, take on things that you know, we shouldn't be responsible, yes, there's an element of that. But in a really important sense, whenever we shirk the responsibility that we meant to take for our lives, for our families, for our church, for the situations in which we find ourselves, the moment we step back and just whinge about things or just passively go along with things, we profoundly disempower ourselves because there is a relationship between authority and responsibility. And when you abdicate responsibility, you give up authority. And this is what happens actually from this point on. Human beings lost their position of, they lost their authority over the world. And now nature, over which they were meant to be the stewards, instead of them being in charge, they're now subject, not only to the natural world, but also to the spiritual world that they were meant to uh, you know, hold in, in subjection in a sense. And we see this, it's interesting, Jesus, when he speaks about Satan, he refers to Satan uh, in the Gospels a couple of times as the prince of this world. The, pr the prince of this world. See, that was us initially. How, how is it it's suddenly that he's saying that about Satan? That how has he become the prince of this world? That's because we, we rebelled against God we abdicated that position of authority and we created an authority vacuum. And so now the world and our lives are plundered by an array of spiritual forces that we have completely lost control of. That's the bad news. But the good news is that having done that, even though we have done that, God's plan is always for restoration. This is one of the most important things. If, you, if you're here today and you feel like my life is a mess or I've gone too far or it's too much or I'm, I'm a write-off, listen, God's plan is always for restoration. Always. And so committed was God to our restoration and restoration first and foremost, I've made this point before, restoration first first and foremost means repositioning. The condition of our lives and of our hearts, that can change subsequent to our repositioning. And in order to reposition us, in order to reconcile us to himself, God himself came to us in Jesus Christ to pay for our sins through his suffering and death so that we could be forgiven and restored. But here's the key. In order to step back through Jesus Christ into that position of authority, we have to take responsibility. We lost authority by shirking responsibility. We regain our authority through Jesus Christ by taking responsibility. We take responsibility for the state of our lives. We take responsibility for the damage that we have done. We take responsibility for the ways in which we have got things wrong. That doesn't mean wallowing. And often people avoid that because oh, I don't want to wallow in negativity. No, this is, it's very important. That's the truth and we have to embrace that. We have to take responsibility for that because that's the first step out of that. You don't, Escape a situation that you're stuck in by shirking responsibility for it. Because I'll say it again, every single time you do that, you disempower yourself. Now I know there may be many respects in which, you know, perhaps other people have done things to you and, and, uh, and maybe you've suffered terrible injustices or, or, you know, the important thing even in those circumstances, you're not responsible for what other people do to you, but you are responsible for the way that you respond. And if you don't take responsibility for the way in which you respond, folks, you disempower yourself from moving outside of that circumstance. 
This is so profound. This is a principle. We are very important biblical principle. We are responsible. It's amazing how much damage we do when we blindly don't think that we're responsible for things. It's really important we take responsibility in three spheres, in this order. And remember, order is very important. In this order, we take responsibility, number one, for our families. We take responsibility for the state of our family relationships first. Secondly, we take responsibility for our church community as a kind of, it's, see, Ultimately, your ministry, God wants you to be ministers in the world, right? In your workplace and social situations. That's our primary context for ministry. But what God asks of us is that he asks a kind of tithe, actually. It's kind of first fruits of our giftings and capacities. He said, I want you to sow first into the community, bless one another so that we can all be equipped together to reach the world around us. So first, we take responsibility for our families. Stop blaming the other person. Stop, you know, recognize how, how am I responsible? What can I take responsibility for here? For it. Secondly, we step into those opportunities. We sow with respect to our capacities and our giftings. We bring something to the altar. We take responsibility for our church. A church is made up of a whole lot of people who are all taking responsibility for the purpose of God. And then those workplaces and those problematic situations that we are part of out in the world, when you practice those two things in these two contexts, when you take the opportunity in all those micro situations, when you take responsibility then when things go awry around you in the various contexts that you're in, you're less likely to stand back and just whinge about things. <laughs> you're less likely to just stand back and just judge everyone else. Oh, those stupid people, and how can they do that? And what are they doing? And no, no, you will always see every, you will, in every circumstance, because we're looking to step back into that position. This is why Jesus came and died and, and reconciled us to God so we could step back into who we're meant to be. So what it means is that we now view every circumstance as an opportunity to step in, not step back, but step in and take responsibility. What can I take responsibility for here? How can I change this environment? Lord, what are you calling me to do? Don't play God. Don't try and control the situation. That's not what it means to rule the earth and subdue it. In God's economy, Ruling means like serving. Jesus talked a lot about that, and I'm not going to go into that now. But if you want to change something, serve it. In every circumstance, in every moment of life, we have these micro opportunities to take an element of responsibility and essentially become more human. Every time you take responsibility, we fulfill our humanity. As I said, it's amazing how much effect uh, we have. You, you'd be amazed at how much effect you actually do have in your family, in the church, in your environments. You have a massive effect, even if you think you're just being, po you're just being passive. I mean, each of us has not only a present effect, but we have an ongoing effect effect in an ongoing, even generation, multi-generational effect. Now, I know some people dislike, oh man, that's just too much responsibility to think how I act is gonna have multi-generational uh, effect. Welcome to being human. This is the high, high dignity of our humanness, is that our actions really, really matter what we model in our families, what we give into our church, your increment, your aspect of that really matters. And if you step back 
and leave the responsibility for everyone else. It really matters when you do that. But when you step in and you make that a habit of life, as I said, not taking responsibility for everything, don't feel, the, don't let this seem like a burden. No, this is a principle of empowerment. This will empower you when you take responsibility for your part. And life presents us constantly with opportunities to do this. It's a way of living. I'm gonna take responsibility. Firstly, I'm gonna take responsibility for how I got things wrong. And then I'm gonna take responsibility for the part that God wants me to play. I sense God saying to us today, you've been sitting back Perhaps you thought, oh, I don't have much to offer in these various circumstances. Maybe you feel uh, unable to do that. God says to you, if you are willing to take responsibility, step in. He's calling you to step into the circle of responsibility. And he's saying, when you do that, I will empower you. I will empower you. If you will just step in, then you will begin to grow then you will begin to become who you were created to be. There's an activation here. There's an amazing opportunity for activation here. We live our lives way too passively. And I know you're all busy, but even in our busyness, we can be very, very passive in this spiritual sense. And I believe God is looking to activate lives. And he does that in the family, in his church, and it has repercussions for the rest of our lives. 